State of the Nation, Analysis of the Welsh Labour Market. We kick off the first webinar with an overall look at the state of the labour market in Wales, with particular focus on the impact of the crisis since March in terms of its effects on employer demand, unemployment and industry exposure. Colegae Cymru Chief Executive Yestin Davis also looks at the challenges from an FE perspective. In addition, the session looks at more general risks and opportunities brought about by automation. Good morning everybody and welcome to the MZ and Colegae Cymru conference series. My name is John Gray, Director of Further Education at MZ. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Duncan Brown, Senior Economist at MZ, and Yestin Davis, Chief Executive at Colegae Cymru. Um, so before we get into today's session, I, I just wanted to quickly explain the purpose of this conference series. Um, so as we all know, these have been unprecedented and very challenging times for everyone. Um, and we know that leading a college through these times is exceptionally challenging. Um, so talking this through um, with Yestin and his team um, over recent months, we wanted to bring our expertise together to help colleges understand some of the data which will give insight to the impact on, on the Welsh economy. Um, so, so bringing together MZ as global leaders in labour market information and calling it a as the voice of the FE sector in Wales, we've put together this four part webinar series. So in session one, which is today, um, Duncan will take us through a state of the nation for Wales with analysis of the Welsh labour market and specifically looking at uh, COVID, um, automation and beyond. And, and what he'll do within this session is highlight some of the key risks and questions to consider. Um, then in session two on Friday, which um, I hope you can all join us for again, uh, Yestin will convene a discussion about how colleges can lead the recovery in their local communities. Uh, and to do this, he'll be joined by three college principals from Wales um, and MZ UK Managing Director Andy Derman. So that will be a, a great session on Friday. Um, so this week uh, is giving us the, that broad oversight. It's given us the, the headline um, data for Wales and, and for our colleges to consider. And then next week into sessions three and four, um, we, we then get into a bit more detail and look at how we can use labour market information to inform curriculum strategy and careers insight. Um, so that's sessions three and four, which will be uh, next week. Um, and for those sessions, um, which will be presented by myself, um, I look forward to be joined by some, uh, some guests from our MZ customers um, from, uh, from the, our Welsh um, colleges. Um, so if you have any questions for, for today's session, please pop them in your um, control panel and um, hopefully on the control panel you'll see a, a section there for questions. Uh, please add them as we go through the session um, and uh, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can uh, as we get towards the end. So that's enough for me for now. now um, I therefore want to hand over to today's keynote speaker, Duncan Brown, who will take us through a state of the nation for the Welsh labour market. Thanks, John. Um, so what I'm going to be focusing on here is, well, the obvious question, uh, which is COVID and what it's meant for the Welsh labour market. Um, but then we're also going to just discuss a few of the sort of the wider points about sort of uh, automation and it, um, uh, Brexit will be in the background as well. And those kind of further disruptions that the labour market can face and sort of just really to think about them and sort of how they can kind of prepare um, the, uh, 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 how you can prepare for them and think about them uh, robustly, really. Um, so the, the, the bit that we're all immediately concerned about is about COVID. And so I just want to start off with a little bit of context about the Welsh economy as it was before COVID arrived. And so uh, I, I don't think there's too many surprises here. So the first chart here has the number of jobs in each industry and the red dots are what the uh, the jobs would be if Wales was like the UK. Um, and so what we're really focusing on here is uh, how and why it's different. And so uh, what you see is that um, the biggest green bar for jobs in Wales is human health and social work activities. And that's pretty normal uh, because it's always going to be a big employer. It's a very labour intensive sector. But what is interesting is that it's even more of an employer in Wales than it is nationally. So you can see there nationally it'd be about 175,000 jobs, whereas in Wales it's more like 220,000. So it's you know, clearly a big concentration there. Uh, and the sort of the flip side of that is that the other 
typically big employer is wholesale and retail trade, which is still big in Wales, but is smaller than it is in the UK. At UK level, you've got kind of places like London, which have a huge retail centre. Um, and, and Wales uh, doesn't have sort of the, the kind of the, the, the sort of the touristy shopping sort of concentration that, uh, uh, that you get there. Um, there are, there'll obviously be variations. So, you know, there'll be more in the, the sort of the larger cities. But overall, Wales has fewer jobs in retail than nationally. And then the third one there, uh, and I don't think this will be too much of a surprise, is that manufacturing is much bigger in Wales than it is nationally, by around 20, 25% uh, larger in jobs terms. A bit more on accommodation and food services, uh, hotels and restaurants because of the tourist sector. And then other sort of concentrations that you've got there, uh, public administration and defence, so the government sector is slightly larger in Wales. And then if you go down around the middle, uh, agriculture, forestry and fishing is about twice the size in Wales in terms of jobs than it is nationally. So although it's not a huge number of jobs in Wales, it is still uh, you know, much more concentrated than you see nationally. And of course, the corollary of those concentrations in manufacturing and government and agriculture is that you've got some other sectors where uh, Wales is much lower than nationally. So you can see there administrative and support, professional scientific and technical activities, and then further down information and communication. So yeah, I mean that last one, the ICT sector, less than half the number of jobs in Wales than you would expect if it was like the UK economy. So quite an interesting mix of differences. We can also split jobs down by the kind of work that people do. And obviously there's a mix of these in every industry. You've got managers and you've got professionals and then you've got uh, production workers. Um, and so uh, at the top there, the biggest group everywhere is professional occupations. But as you can see, again, the red dot represents the UK. There are fewer professional jobs in Wales than nationally. Not hugely fewer, but sort of, you know, in the five to 10 percent range. Whereas there are slightly more elementary occupation jobs, fewer professional and technical jobs, and then down in the middle, more skilled trades and more caring later and other service occupations. As we saw, there's a concentration of health and uh, social work, so it's no surprise really that there's more caring uh, uh, jobs in the country as well. Um, we can also look at how those types of jobs have changed over the, the four years up to 2019 to just see where the job creation is coming. And the biggest job creation is in elementary occupations, uh, where something like around 12,000 jobs were created in that time uh, net, uh, which is about 7% growth. Uh, professional occupations were second, but they are the largest, so growth is a bit slower there, 4.5%. And then administrative and secretarial, which uh, doesn't grow that strongly across the UK, but has grown by 6.2%, so pretty large. And then skilled trades are also growing well, whereas there are these other jobs further down. So sales and customer service occupations, which uh, uh, were in negative territory. Um, so uh, one of the things that we collect at MZ are online job postings. We uh, Before COVID, we were collecting around 800,000 a month. Uh, the, the monthly total has been all over the shop since then, so I won't uh, attempt to guess at what the average has been since uh, uh, April. Um, and we've been doing this since the start of 2016, so we've got a database of around 40, 45 million job postings, and we tag them all across a very comprehensive skills library. And so breaking jobs up into the, the sort of these four broad categories, high skill, middle skill, service oriented and labour intensive, we can just look at what are the skills that are uh, uh, particularly concentrated in Wales. And one of the things that really comes out straight away is that that health concentration that you've got in uh, Wales uh, shows through. So in high school, you've got nursing, mental health, nursing care, social work, physical therapy and primary care. And then in service oriented as well, personal care, mental health, learning disabilities and so on. But then there are others in there. So at the middle school level, you can see the effects of manufacturing. So you've got things in there like mechanics and carpentry. Uh, well, not so much in manufacturing, but hydraulics and MIG welding and pneumatics. And then at the labour intensive end, you've got a mix of warehousing, restaurant operation uh, skills, and sort of uh, that's the more general kind of uh, uh, service economy that sort of supports uh, local society in large part. Um, so that gives you a sense of uh, the sort of the skills as it was before. Um, but then COVID arrived in March this year and changed 
pretty much everything in terms of lo uh, local labour markets across the country. Um, uh, so, you know, across the UK and then also within Wales as well. Um, so the first way we have to make it is just some really simple comparisons where we've set um, uh, uh, these two measures at 100 for December 2019. And the first one at the top there is the claimant count, which is the, the, sort of the number of people that are claiming benefits. It used to be unemployment benefit, and, but now universal credits arrived, it's made it a, a lot more complex. So you can end up on this even if you're not unemployed. Um, and so what you see there is uh, pretty much from March to May, uh, the claimant count basically doubled. So we had sort of uh, the number of people that were claiming benefit, which had been broadly stable for, several, for many years, really, uh, uh, up until March, suddenly just rocketed and doubled in two months. And it then remained fairly stable uh, it, uh, um, uh, from May onwards. And what's interesting and reassuring in part is that actually the sort of the growth in the wider UK is a bit faster. Um, claimant count is not a good measure of unemployment these days, partly because, as I say, um, uh, the fact that you can claim benefits uh, 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 when you're still working and then of course there's the confusion of furlough as well uh, makes it a lot more noisy than it used to be and so a better way of measuring unemployment is to ask people and so the ONS uh, uh, goes out with the Labour Force survey every quarter and asks uh, 80,000 people across the UK uh, uh, what their work situation is and on that measure um, we have seen quite a big increase in unemployment. So from 3% to 3.8% by August. Um, and a bit more worrying is that uh, this morning, just to confuse my slides, which obviously I didn't prepare at 7.30 this morning, the ONS has released a more recent figure, which is taking that up to 4.6%. So it has uh, really uh, gone up at quite a gallop now. So uh, uh, survey-based unemployment, which is people saying that they're looking for work and haven't got a job, has gone up by 50%. And I'm pretty sure, uh, just in case anybody's wondering, that they've explicitly ruled out people who were on furlough um, uh, to make sure that that wasn't counted in there. So there has been quite a big increase. And that's one of the biggest increases in the UK. Um, I think, um, uh, uh, you know, comparing sort of the start of the year to now um, uh, uh, or to September, which is when the latest data is from, I think Wales has, has seen one of the biggest increases, but I did look at that very briefly before the uh, presentation, so don't quote me on that. Uh, and then at the bottom there, we've got the trend of job postings. Now, job postings can be a bit of a noisy indicator because it can be all kinds of reasons why job ads go up and down. Um, but the first thing to say is that Wales is entirely like the rest of the UK in seeing a real uh, sort of plummet from uh, uh, March to May. Um, uh, you know, sort of uh, losing around a third there of uh, the number of job postings that were in circulation. Uh, but what's reassuring it actually is that Wales has actually seen a recovery beyond the levels that we've seen before. So uh, at present, or uh, I think these would be the numbers for October, um, uh, job postings in Wales are above the level that they were in February. Whereas as you can see in the UK, they're still only about halfway recovered. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that that we'll go on to that are unique to Wales. Another thing to bear in mind, though, is that what we're detecting is, is a lot lower churn on job postings, uh, probably because of furlough. It's actually quite difficult to hire people at the moment. Um, uh, so or, or that seems to be the sort of the feedback that we get. And so actually, it seems to be that job postings are sort of waiting around longer. And so that drives the number up. And so uh, the sort of the fact that it's above the level in February is probably more reflective of it being around that level with that extra sort of uh, uh, hanging around quality in there as well. Um, we can actually break that uh, number down to see sort of uh, the, the, the component parts of it in terms of the blue line here is the number of postings that are being added every week since the start of the year and the green line is those that are being taken away. And you can see during the summer, you have this kind of real surge of postings coming back um, while um, expiration, so people taking postings off, will actually lag behind. And it's only recently that it's kind of started to return to a more normal pattern like you see at the start of the year. Uh, whether that will continue given the sort of the fire break uh, in Wales and then the circuit break uh, across the UK uh, uh, more recently, uh, we'll have to see. Um, this is uh, data to the most recent week, but it, it normally takes a few weeks before these things filter in. It certainly did when the pandemic started, 
what you actually saw was first of all this big drop and you can see that before april on the blue line uh, that new postings stopped arriving rather than old postings suddenly being withdrawn people left postings up for a while so um, but another way of breaking it down which is quite useful is to see where the new postings have uh, been materializing and so uh, and this gives a similar pattern to what you see in the rest of the country but just generally more positive and so you see at the top transportation and storage obviously the sort of the logistics economy has fared well since covid because more people are sort of uh, having to buy things online and so on health and social work uh, um, uh, galloping away because obviously that's in higher demand education remains important construction had a really torrid time at the start of the pandemic but has actually recovered well when supply chains got intact and uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, social distancing was implemented and then down at the bottom you see uh, accommodation and food services so the tourist sector and restaurants uh, arts entertainment and recreation uh, uh, as well really sort of still hit quite hard but not as bad as they have been at UK level um, and then if we look at this in occupational terms we see that it's kind of uh, that those elementary occupations which as we've seen have generated the largest number of jobs in recent years have returned to strong advertising the factory sector with process plant and machine operatives is very robust as well um, and so in some ways it's quite interesting with Wales that you've got this kind of mix of sectors which are really quite insulated from Covid so uh, the sort of the strong health service the strong manufacturing sector but then you've also got uh, quite a high level of exposure to Covid through the tourist sector as well so it's kind of quite a split that you get there um, so those skills that we were looking at before we can also see how some of those have been changing as well and so unsurprisingly at the high school level you can see nursing mental health child protection learning disability are galloping away in terms of posting demand with the more commercial facing ones financial services say or business development have really seen a fall the same with service oriented so you've got personal care mental health child protection learning disabilities use of ppe home care meal planning and preparation all still uh, solidly supported while it's the commercial ones again that have suffered and at middle of skill so many of the jobs are in that commercial sector rather than in the uh, health sector say which you, which tends to be either high or uh, lower skill um, that you see falls across the board and then a more mixed pattern on labour intensive where sort of nursing which tends to be caring uh, jobs and PPE and warehousing are robust whereas things like restaurant operation have obviously seen quite large falls so another way we can look at the uh, sort of the impact of COVID is to uh, look at the sort of the, the industry use of furlough um, and uh, that gives us our y-axis variable here so that's the percentage of employees at UK level because that's where the data is strongest uh, have taken on uh, uh, furloughing uh, as a way of uh, avoiding uh, sort of the impact of uh, COVID through uh, the last six months and on the x-axis here we use a measure called location quotient which really measures the ratio of the share of jobs in the Welsh economy to the share of jobs in the UK economy and so if you've got a location quotient of one it means the share is the same as it is nationally as it goes above one it means the industry is more concentrated and so as we saw earlier agriculture forestry and fishery has about twice the number of jobs in Wales than it would if it was similar to the UK economy and so it's far out there on the uh, x-axis whereas information and communication is the lowest on the x-axis because it's got less than half the jobs or fewer than half the jobs than you'd see at the national level and so you can see here that actually the sort of uh, the, the, there's a real mix where you've got accommodation and food services so restaurants and hotels which are strong in Wales and have been really badly affected construction also quite strong in Wales um, and quite badly affected although there is good evidence that it's bounced back quite well and then you've got these other sectors which Wales is strong in like manufacturing health public admin and agriculture uh, which have been much less affected and are also strong so you've got this quite sort of uh, uh, polarized kind of uh, dimension where the more middle affected sectors uh, things like uh, um, uh, uh, transport and story professional scientific and technical are more uh, uh, aren't so important in the Welsh economy and it's the sector that are either badly affected or not badly affected that tend to dominate the Welsh economy 
Um, how that breaks down in terms of the, the types of jobs that are most at risk in Wales, it's fairly predictable. Restaurant uh, roles, hairdressers, uh, waiters and waitresses there, chefs, um, sports players, although if you're a, a Premier League footballer, not so much, um, uh, uh, and aircraft pilots and flight engineers as well. So this is on the basis of how many of those jobs take place in the industries that are badly affected. So a big question here is that hopefully, given the news yesterday, um, things are going to have a chance of returning to some normality next year. Hopefully Pfizer's vaccine and other vaccines in development are going to arrive and going to be rolled out at great speed. And we'll see on the logistics behind that. Um, and so during 2021, we can start to return to normal. And um, uh, But the issue is, what was the normal that we we're going to return to? Because it wasn't like the labour market was frozen in aspic before. And it's quite possible that some of the trends that we know were happening that were disrupting our labour market are going to come back possibly with a bit of a vengeance because some of them might have had a bit of a, a kick up the backside from COVID. And as furlough gets withdrawn at the end of March now, um, might some businesses not return to life because actually things have uh, passed them by. And so for the rest of the presentation, I'm just going to go through some slides around what those longer term disruptions are to just help you think about those as well. And so there are three big disruptions that sort of are uh, in the midst of transforming our economies, really. And so the first one there on the left is automation and robotics. The middle one is about trade, with obviously with Brexit in the background, and we're getting very close to when Brexit really happens, as opposed to just the formalities of leaving the European Union. And then on the right hand side, immigration, which has also been a, a big transformation in the uh, uh, nation's economy. And so a lot of this data comes from UK because that's the level that it's most available at. But first of all, I, I want to start by saying automation is an ongoing process that's been going for quite some time. We've talked a lot more about it in the last decade, but it's always been there. So here at the top, we have the typical weekly hours of people. And at the bottom, we have the total annual hours worked in the economy. And you can see that over time uh, from uh, uh, at the end of the war, until really the 2000s, the typical working week fell. And uh, you, you, it actually comes in several component parts. So uh, um, uh, uh, in the early period, it was that the actual working week was falling, whereas since the 80s, you've actually had the growth of part-time work. So the number of people who are working full-time uh, have seen relatively little difference in their uh, working week, whereas you've got more workers working at fewer hours. Uh, and that combines with the number of workers, which of course is changing over time too. And so you can actually see the number of hours in the economy hasn't just fallen, because that top chart makes you think of automation as being something where we just work fewer hours because the machines are doing it for us. But the bottom chart shows us it's not quite so simple because we see that the number of total hours worked uh, in the economy every year actually hit rock bottom in the early eighties. And then since then, has had a real kind of continued upsurge. You have a, a dip for the two recessions, but other than that, it's continued to grow. And that, that's quite an interesting sign that during that kind of 50s to 70s period, the falling working week meant fewer work, hours worked overall. But since then, it's changed. And it's changed for two big reasons. One is uh, the increasing role of women in the economy. Uh, so if you go back to the sort of the, the 60s and 70s, then a lot more women weren't at work throughout their whole working lives. Um, whereas since the 80s, um, that's become much more the norm. And then the other side uh, from the 90s is immigration, where we've actually seen across the UK a continued inflow of uh, uh, new workers, which has meant that even though the uh, typical working hours has continued to fall slightly, actually um, uh, the total hours have uh, galloped ahead, really. And so it means that sort of uh, uh, the machines don't have it all their own way. We are continuing to be able to create work for people, even though, as this chart shows, um, uh, 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 machines have had a big impact. So this is for the manufacturing sector specifically. It goes from 1948 to about 2016, I think. And so the green line here is the manufacturing employment. And it's no surprise to know that um, manufacturing employment is a shadow of its former self. So from the uh, sort of uh, the end of the 60s until really the sort of the 2010s, it saw a continued uh, reduction, really losing something like 60, 70% of its uh, uh, employment. 
And yet over that same period, the output of the manufacturing sector in terms of what people are willing to pay for its goods and services uh, uh, was actually pretty stable. It fell a, a little bit in the wake of the recession and for a number of reasons in the early 2000s. But overall, um, uh, there's a lot more manufacturing output per worker. And you can see that on the purple line here, which is um, uh, you can see that actually from 1948 to 2016, uh, manufacturing employment basically quadruple uh, productivity sorry quadrupled in that time and so you've had this big reduction in employment a sort of a, a compared to 1948 an increase in the output and together those two things mean that productivity has increased and so uh, you've got these uh, two facts across these two last slides one is that we continue to create new work so there's no shortage of work and then on the other hand we've got a um, uh, uh, that uh, machines have allowed some industries, um, manufacturing in this particular case, to actually see rising productivity. And you can see this again here, where actually, so on the top, we've got a measure of automation, which is the capital stock per worker, the value of the machines that we have in our workplaces. On the middle, we've got growth in output per worker, so that's a measure of productivity. And then on the bottom, we've got employment overall. And what you can see is that there's no clear kind of easy pattern that goes uh, from uh, uh, machines to employment. And in fact, actually, uh, uh, you, know, you might say that it, uh, over time, more machines means fewer uh, demands on people. But actually, for most of the period here from the 60s until uh, the last few years, you've seen actually galloping capital per worker. And yet employment has continued to kind of be able to grow. And the really interesting period is right at the end when capital stock per worker, so investment uh, growth, has been actually really quite slow by historic standards. So the period since 2010 has been uh, uh, pretty poor for investment, whereas employment has grown really strongly at, at year on year. This will be the first year where that stops since 2010 because of COVID. Um, and probably the, the main difference is because of migration. So effectively, large uh, sectors within the economy have been able to opt to expand their labour supply rather than their capital supply. And so if you think about sectors like certain parts of agriculture, uh, they've opted for more labour intensive methods of production rather than investing in more machinery. And so uh, what that suggests is that automation doesn't automatically go one way. It can go the other way if uh, incentives change. But there's lots of uncertainties around and that applies not just to automation, but to the other two as well. So automation, the first one there is technology innovation is highly unpredictable. As we've just seen, um, uh, um, we've actually seen less investment and more employment growth in the past few years uh, um, uh, than the reverse, even though we've talked about nothing but technology innovation and technology is all around us. And, you know, because of COVID, so many of us are now sort of using technology in a way that we've never done before. Often technology can be invented, but can take a long time to come into use. The first computer was invented by the ancient Greeks. Um, uh, the Antikeros mechanism, I think it's called, a big mechanical computer that, uh, that they found bits of, um, but they just did it for fun seemingly and didn't do anything with it. Uh, so, you know, it, it shows that actually, you know, that kind of technology didn't reappear until sort of the 19th century uh, uh, with the early mechanical computers. And so you can see how, just because the technology is there, it doesn't mean it gets used. COVID has been a big exercise in adopting technology, actually. Uh, you know, Zoom was already there. It's just that people started using it in such large numbers. And then, as I say about immigration, economics still matters. Um, if uh, there's enough workers there, then um, uh, technology won't be adopted. Car washes, we've had mechanical car washes for decades, and actually they've been in steep decline in the past 20 years because they've not been able to compete with uh, uh, manual car washes. Um, so Brexit um, uh, uh, means that trade is highly uncertain. We don't know trading arrangements for next year for our, you know, half of our trade effectively. Um, for large countries, though, trade effects are all in the detail. It's kind of, you know, very small sort of changes in products and services can have quite a big effect. Um, and um, another side of this is that the, the changes that might be wrought by Brexit and other trading changes uh, can take time because just because you wouldn't build a factory now doesn't mean you'll close it down overnight. It's still got value there because you've already invested in it. It just means that you might not expand it and you might allow it to run down. So it doesn't mean that overnight all factories close as a result of trade changes. 
And then on migration, I mean, we've had record levels of immigration for the past 10 to 20 years. And in the long run, labor supply creates demand. We've seen that on the previous chart. So if there are more workers, employers will look to find work for them to do because uh, uh, they will compete for the work that's available. But of course, that means that the economy is always being reshaped. And I said before about the uh, agriculture sector changing to become more labor intensive because those works have been available. And so actually that means that those kind of jobs have become uh, potentially you know, less dependent on language, for example, because migrant workers are doing them and you don't want to depend so much on that. On the other hand, it means uh, more workers are available from the, sort of the native workforce to be able to uh, focus on those kind of uh, communication challenges. And so it's always reshaping the economy with it. Um, Another thing uh, that's worth mentioning is that when we talk about automation, it's easy to think that we're sort of at the forefront because we are an advanced economy and we are. But actually, um, uh, there's potentially a long way for us to go. So this is a measure. There's a, a body called the International Federation of Robotics, which captures data on how many uh, robots are being used in factories around the world. And what you can see here is that the UK is actually uh, around the level of advanced economies generally but way behind the leaders. I mean, you look at uh, South Korea, and this is robots per 10,000 manufacturing employees, and they've got about eight times the rate of robots in factories than we have. Um, Germany's got sort of uh, 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 four or five or four, four times the, the rate in Japan too. Um, and then even France is, uh, you know, which we consider a, a relatively similar economy in Italy as well are kind of in this sort of the two, two and a half times the level of robots. Now, some of this reflects uh, certain industries we're in, in manufacturing, um, which are more favorable to robotics, but some of it also reflects just a, a sort of a lack of investment, relatively speaking. And so uh, on the one hand, this suggests that ro uh, automation could have a huge effect if we just caught up with other countries. On the other hand, we haven't caught up so far. So it suggests that there, there are these other factors in play. To sort of measure the risk uh, um, uh, in terms of robotics, what we do is we've got data on sort of the amount of time taken in different tasks. And so these are all the task categories in different occupations. And so at the high risk end for automation, you've got things like uh, admin work and uh, controlling machines, uh, and, uh, operating devices, things like that. And then at the low risk end, you've got things like guiding and directing and motivating subordinates, uh, caring for others, um, coaching others, thinking creatively, these are things that are not good for machines. And then you've got this category in the middle, which is a bit more ambiguous, analyzing data and information. Uh, there's always an element of human judgment there, but machines can also help you do it a lot faster. So that it's probably more of a complement to technology there. And so those are the different ways we measure technology and uh, we can think about how they affect different kinds of work. It's also important to know that when we talk about automation, it's a bit of a casual kind of shorthand which does really kind of summarize the whole situation. So uh, I've just got some examples of different uh, types of automation that are going on here, and they have very different kind of looks to them. So at the top left there, you've got modern methods of construction where you build buildings in factories and then assemble them on site. So that's um, uh, automation only in a sort of a process way. The, the work is still being done often by humans, but in a different setting, but it means that there's less to and froing of work and more actual focus on the substance. Then you've got those McDonald's uh, 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 self-checkout machines there. They were invented in Europe, uh, interestingly, not in America because uh, labor costs more in Europe, generally speaking, than America. And so they wanted a way of uh, uh, slimming down their workforce at McDonald's. They've now started to appear in America. Um, and uh, But it's quite interesting because effectively it puts uh, uh, it means that you don't have as many uh, workers at the checkout. Uh, it means that you actually put some of the labor onto the customer to work it out for themselves. Um, but again, it's another form of what we call automation, but it's not just the actual machine. It's this sort of the process that goes around it. On the top right there is a picture of uh, agriculture in the Netherlands, which is the most highly productive farming sector in the world. And if you Google uh, Netherlands agriculture, National Geographic, there's a brilliant uh, article on this about their use of technology and so those fields there have just rows of lights to encourage the growth of uh, crops so they get uh, a lot more uh, yield all, all the time and that, that's quite standard practice in the, the Netherlands farming sector and so there you're using technology not to sort of take away labour but to just multiply the results of what your farm generates basically. Then at the bottom left you've got Everlaw 
uh, which is software which will read lots of legal documents for you and organize them and find out things for you. So that's taking away the sort of the boring work of uh, uh, lawyers going through lots of documents and getting a machine to do it for you. And then at the bottom right, it's an Ocado warehouse where those things that look like washing machines are uh, rushing around that grid, picking up groceries and putting them into uh, people shopping for you. So that is a, a purer robotic case. So these are all the different ways that technology can change the workplace. And it's not all uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger being the Terminator, put it that way. So um, uh, what I've got here is a chart that shows how different industries are exposed to technology. And so uh, along the x-axis, we've got the percentage of work in those industries that are highly exposed in those high risk categories. And then we can also look at how jobs have grown over time. And there's a slight drift uh, where more exposure to technology has caused lower employment growth, but it's not sort of a simple matter. One of the interesting sides and important for Wales is that the industries that are less exposed are those that are uh, um, not strong in Wales. So uh, we talked earlier about IT being fewer than half the jobs in Wales than it would be at UK level. Well, computer programming is unsurprisingly fast growing and low exposed to uh, automation replacing jobs. Uh, professional scientific and technical is also not uh, large in Wales. So activities of head offices and management consultancy fits in that there. Whereas a lot of your manufacturing sectors are down at this uh, bottom right uh, where you've got uh, slow employment growth in recent years and really high exposure to technology. So effectively, there is that sort of squeeze of technology on them there. Um, an interesting case in the middle at the top there is uh, remediation activities and other waste management services, which is the recycling sector, which is quite exposed to technology, but has been growing really strongly in jobs terms in the past few decades, mainly because of regulatory change, because obviously there's a, a big push on for us to recycle more as a country. Um, and so then uh, we look at trade and we can see how trade has been changing rapidly over time already, even before we get to Brexit. And so at the top there, you've got Slovakia, which is within the EU. And uh, from 1999 to 2016, um, our trade with Slovakia in terms of imports from there grew by two and a half thousand percent. And it's now 2.7 billion pounds for a relatively small country. This is the effect of their opening from the Eastern Bloc and then they're joining the European Union. Uh, Slovakia has become a major manufacturing sector. Poland, uh, which is a much bigger place, has grown by around 1,300, 1,400% to now being 9.4 billion. Vietnam has grown by 1,200%. Uh, China, of course, is the biggie. Uh, and you know, even in the period from 1999, when it had already started, it's grown by a thousand percent our imports from China and now constitute 40 billion pounds. So considering that's somewhere across the other side of the world, you can really see the changes. And so trade has been transforming the economy already um, in large part, and not just with the EU either, China, Turkey is in there as well, India. And so, uh, um, these are big changes. This is what we talk about when we talk about globalization. And obviously that has big implications in terms of uh, um, uh, the manufacturing sector, because these are goods imports here. And it's often been manufacturing that has kind of been offshored uh, with quite big implications for uh, uh, local and regional economies in the UK. Um, of course, the big question for the near future is about Brexit. Um, and it's an interesting side that actually um, uh, so here is very similar to the previous technology chart where we've got uh, the growth in jobs on the y-axis and the, uh, the share of sales to the EU. And you can see that sectors where we've got high shares of sales to the EU haven't seen big jobs growth. And so, again, it's like these manufacturing sectors. And so it's quite interesting that although in the short term, uh, if there are trade restrictions with Europe, that will cause uh, turbulence and uh, shocks in transition. Um, the areas where we've seen the biggest growth uh, uh, in our uh, um, export sales to the EU haven't seen the biggest um, uh, uh, growth in jobs. And so it's quite interesting in terms of uh, uh, the long term ramifications of that, that uh, a reconfiguration of trade might not be so negative for jobs as we might think in the long term, even if the shock is uh, uh, problematic in the short term. And then finally, on immigration. Um, this is a, a, a sense of how much the sort of uh, immigration factor in the labour market has changed. So setting 2007 as our index year where uh, uh, 
number of employees is 100. Uh, the number of British nationals has only grown by a few percent since then, whereas the number of foreign nationals has grown by around 70 percent since then. So you can see how immigration has become a really uh, much more significant part of the economy. Um, and here we do the same again uh, as we've done for technology and trade before. And we see that there's a, a much more ambiguous relationship between growth in jobs and the share of immigration, where manufactured food products, which is the most migration intensive, uh, with uh, uh, nearly 30 percent of its workforce from uh, uh, foreign nationals, has actually sort of uh, seen relatively neutral job growth in that time. And actually, there's much more of a mix here. And that's because, of course, on the one hand, industries which have affected lots of migrants are often less fashionable industries and so were in decline. But some of them have also been able to uh, find new business models where they've been able to uh, tap abundant labour supply. So it's quite interesting in that sense. Um, but one of the interesting interactions in the background is that um, on the one hand, we talk about automation and the same applies to trade uh, as a potential replacement of jobs. So we can use machines to do those jobs instead. On the other hand, what we've been doing with migration is uh, uh, attracting workers to come and do different jobs, uh, as I said a moment ago, some of them less fashionable jobs in many ways. And so I guess the question for the long term is how sustainable that is, because some of those jobs that we're expanding on the base of migrant workforce might actually become uh, automatable in the near future. And so what we do here is we take every occupation, so every dot is an occupation, and we rank them in co according to how reliant they are on migrants and how exposed they are to technology. And you see this quadrant on the top left where you've got chefs and care workers, for example. These are the jobs that have been relying on migrants more and more, but also are difficult to automate. And so th those are the ones where it makes sense to think about migration as a potential um, labour supply strategy. Whereas those on the top right here, things like uh, storage roles, weights and waitresses, uh, bar staff, um, those are the ones that, you know, those McDonald's machines allow more automation. Uh, you know, warehousing has expanded greatly, but actually, uh, as that Ocado example shows, there's robots that are coming for those jobs too. And yet we've been expanding those jobs partly on the basis of migration in recent years. And so it does lead to a question of sustainability there. So to sum up, uh, first of all, with the COVID stuff, uh, health, manufacturing, agriculture and government uh, which gives where they all give whales some strength, which are actually relatively COVID proof. You know, they're all sectors that are either key worker or relatively doable to socially distance. Um, bad but could be worse. Um, unemployment rise in Wales is bad, but the UK wide is worse. Wales is closing fast on the UK wide rate, as I found out this morning with the new data. So that that's not quite as true as it was on Friday when I did this slide. Um, but it's still not you know, as bad as uh, uh, some parts of the UK. And so hopefully uh, uh, the rise won't continue. Um, again, bad, but could be worse. And this still remains the case. Recruitment was hit hard in the spring, but has bounced back really fast, um, which is good and probably reflects those strengths in health and manufacturing and so on. Um, the hospitality sector is a concentration in Wales and is a worry, particularly affected by COVID, of course. Um, and then on the wider disruptions, uh, technology, trade and migration, uh, are all different paths to getting higher economic performance and all with pros and cons. And technology is a, a bit of a threat and a promise because technology is what has driven productivity growth before from the industrial revolution to now. It's how we've become better off as a society, but it's disruptive. If you're on the receiving end, if you're the worker that's being replaced by a machine, then it's pretty bad. And so it's how you help people adjust to that and adapt to that that's really important. Um, technology doesn't work in isolation, as we talked about. Um, more migration has probably meant that we've invested less uh, relative to what we would have done because uh, you know, labour supply has allowed it a sort of more labour intensive model. And so there's knock on consequences in different ways. And Brexit will have knock on consequences on them all. Um, immediately it will have effects on trade and migration. But you know, if we need to uh, uh, produce more of our low tech goods here, for example, because we don't import them from Slovakia, then we might have a <clears throat> less of a move to technology. Um, and so, and then of course, a big consequence of colleges here is that all these changes in business models and the economics of it have big implications for skills demand and the challenge is to try and anticipate what that means for you. That's me.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Duncan, for a really thought-provoking uh, session there. There's so much detail to consider and uh, often easy, you know, when we're in the middle of this COVID crisis, just to forget those kind of wider implications as well. Um, not that I'm suggesting any of us are doing that. Um, so, um, Duncan, a, a question from me just to just to kick things off really is, um, before we hear from, from Yestin, what do you think are the biggest challenges um, colleges will face developing curriculum over the short term? Well, so, I mean, the obvious kind of big implication is the same for everybody in the economy right now, which is working out um, how much of what's going on now is going to be permanent and how much of it is going to be uh, um, temporary. So, you know, assuming there's a vaccine, uh, given yesterday's news next year, at some point, the tourist sector can start to look forward to business as usual but how much of it will be business as usual and how you know how many businesses will have fallen by the wayside in the meantime um, mm -hmm. and then you know bigger changes in terms of you know how many jobs are going to be work from home in the future and how, how does that change the demand for different kinds of jobs so you know there's that immediate kind of problem of working out how to prepare people for the near future um, uh, when everything is in so much chaos. If the vaccine doesn't arrive or doesn't work as planned, then uh, you know those jobs in tourism are, are going to be in real trouble. And so immediately you've got those kind of problems. And I think um, what we've done here is set out the sort of the data on what are the industries that are you know already recovering well. So we've seen things like manufacturing and construction, which were badly affected at first, but have bounced back pretty well. And we know that therefore that there's work to be done there and they will continue to be so. Um, in the longer term, it's about uh, thinking about, uh, um, uh, given those three big disruptions of technology, trade and migration, a lot of it is about adaptability. And so thinking about not only making sure that people are equipped for the job that they want, but also the jobs that they can be doing as well. And so transferable skills uh, also uh, become more important because, you know, uh, as we've grown used to in recent decades, but it looks likely to accelerate into the future, um, jobs aren't, aren't, aren't stable. They're going to change. Technology will change them. Um, sometimes technology will take them away and create new ones. And so uh, equipping uh, everybody with a sort of a, a good set of transferable skills as well as their more specialist ones become more important. And, and that also means, for example, that some of the basic skills um, uh, remain con very important. You know, being able to speak English is, uh, uh, you know, and Welsh in parts of Wales as well, um, uh, very important because that's kind of the the natural kind of currency of uh, of work, especially in a, a sort of a more social oriented economy as we have now. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sir Duncan. We will certainly follow this, uh, the sessions next week. Look at, uh, at skills demand in, in a bit more detail. Um, so, so des uh, yes, then just bringing you into the uh, into the fore now um, to, to put Duncan's insight into context. Can you tell us a, a bit about um, what you think will be the main implications for colleges um, and, and how you've been working with them uh, up to date to understand and address these? Well, thanks, John. Yes, that's a really good question. And thanks, Duncan, for that really in-depth sort of analysis of what's going on in the labour market. Um, yeah, well, what does this mean for colleges and colleges in Wales? Well, obviously, those of you who have been following the Clegg Cymru position over now the last four or five years uh, will be aware of the fact that we pay a lot of attention in our policy responses and helping colleges respond in terms of policy uh, to the foundational economy. And uh, that's that sort of mundane day in, day out part of the economy. Uh, that does supply us those kind of core uh, health and social care um, job opportunities and, and, and services. It's where construction sits, the vast majority of construction, uh, and of course other activities that can often be quite highly skilled, uh, but a focus around a local community and where people uh, need to live and, and work. So again, in, in the context of understanding this, this data for Wales, uh, please expect us throughout these seminars and indeed throughout our work leading up to the election in May, and as Clegg can to be looking particularly at the implications for us as colleges in terms of foundation economy. What we're also sort of looking at, of course, is, is the human element. Uh, all that data that you've seen, uh, and, and the slides will be shared with you, uh, all the data on those slides is actually about individuals, human beings. Uh, it's their real life that obviously that is of interest to us, uh, not just obviously how that looks like on a graph or on a pie chart or something. So we need to be prepared to help colleges respond to the implications this has 
uh, for individuals. And, uh, and sometimes you know, individuals have quite messy behaviors. They don't always follow a graph or a trend or don't always uh, do what we expect them to do. So we need to be prepared as a sector to be responsive uh, to, to that reality really. So yeah, these, these seminars, um, as many of you will be aware, are, are obviously about helping you uh, as, as, as leaders and as managers and in, individuals in colleges to respond to what is often referred to as the skills demand agenda. Uh, no, obviously you'll be aware of the fact that sometimes colleges are accused, wrongly we think, of simply just providing you know, skills supply uh, and there needs to be some sort of balance in terms of skill demand. Now it's not as simple as that, it's not a simple equation of your know, value in and a value out, it's much much more complex, uh, but these seminars are about helping you to respond to that particular uh, query and question, uh, particularly for people like the regional skills partnerships of course. So yeah, pay attention please to health and social care construction. We've done some work in those areas for our manifesto. We've recently done some work in agriculture and land-based for, for the six land-based colleges that we've got as part of our network. Uh, and obviously, as you're aware, be aware of the impact it's having on food and hospitality. Uh, but then please don't neglect in your response how you can be supporting local manufacturing businesses. Now those manufacturing businesses are not technically just part of the foundation economy. They kind of sit uh, if you like around it and are strengthened and supportive of the foundation economy but whether you are looking at the the, the foundation economy or manufacturing or other things like aviation and, and more technologically advanced international supply trade um, chain based businesses the reality is of course wales is an sme and a micro sme dominated uh, economy and what we hope to be able to do over these next three seminars is look at ways we can respond uh, to the particular needs of SMEs. But I suppose at the moment, John and Duncan, my real concern is about individuals and how as colleges we can support those individuals in what are going to be incredibly turbulent times. So I would urge us in all the conversations we're having in these seminars and the other work that we're doing as we approach next year's curriculum planning, to think about how we can support young people who we know are going to be those who are most likely to be impacted uh, by COVID, those who are most likely to be displaced immediately from the, the, the labour market, and in particular, obviously, young girls between the age of 16 and 24, who we know in terms of industries that have been put into shutdown, uh, are the individuals that are most likely to be affected. So just, just, just to, to finish, we need to think about the um, Welsh Government policy responses and indeed the UK Government policy responses, such as the Skills and Jobs Fund, such as the um, evolution of the personal learning accounts away from the two pilots that we ran uh, in two colleges last year and towards now some of this replacing the skills development fund, looking at those who are in work, uh, but whose work earnings obviously are below, below average, and also then obviously how we would be looking to be delivering new employability programs, uh, if and when, probably if these days, if those attended successfully, how can colleges help, help work in that environment as well, as well as courses being the major provider uh, of work-based learning. So lots of challenges there, um, uh, Duncan, based on your, your information and something we can get our heads around by using MZ's data, John. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of these seminars to make sure that we can actually sort of take that knowledge, because knowledge itself is not power, of course. It's the strategic application of knowledge that's power, and power we want to put in your hands as colleges, and ultimately to put in the hands of your individual learners uh, in your institutions across Wales. Excellent. Thanks so much for that yesterday. And, and the, you know, definitely the uh, we, we've set those next three sessions up quite nicely there with how to um, e explore the information from today um, in, in more detail. Um, certainly for those of you who are joining the session on Friday, please think of some questions to put to uh, yesterday in the panel. Um, so, so just last few minutes to finish off now. We, we have had a few questions come through. Um, we might not get a chance to answer all of these. So if we don't, we'll try to um, provide um, an answer to the individuals later on. Um, so the first one, probably one for, for Duncan, um, and um, you know, quite quite a, quite a complex question. So this is mm. saying, due to the uh, combinatorial exponential, exponential technological developments, are we not heading towards a zero marginal cost society, as Jeremy Rifkin suggests? Um, so mm. um, I'll put that one to Duncan. If we've not got no. time for that, pick that one up offline. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's early in the morning for that. Um, I, I I don't know. I I think that these kind of predictions are sort of um, um, often made about sort of uh, the end of this and the end of that, and I'm not entirely convinced that that's the case yet. Anyway, so uh, yeah, but uh, um, 
but I, I, I'm happy to talk more about it offline rather than spend 10 minutes waxing lyrical about it for now. Oh, thank, thank you, Duncan. Um, so one for, probably for, for Yestin or maybe for, for Duncan as well. Um, so do you feel that the new way of working for, for colleges has accelerated the development of digital learning and curriculum development? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what we have to recognise, of course, is that education, both FE and HE provision, is itself an economic sector and an employment sector. So we need to understand, obviously, how these things are changing us uh, as employers and as an organisations. Uh, is it accelerating? Well, clearly, um, we are seeing, obviously, we, and we saw almost overnight, didn't we, back in March, the need uh, to switch to forms of blended or digital first learning in a way that maybe we'd struggle to get our heads around for, for, for quite a few years um, uh, before. I can remember my first ever Clegg Company conference. I wasn't an employee of Clegg Company at the time. I was working for the Federation of Small Businesses. Uh, and actually, there was a whole session back five, six years ago on digital and blended learning. Um, but we've managed to, 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 to distribute that kind of way of, of, of learning now, perhaps. But, you know, we know there's real challenges in, in how we, we do it, because there is some, obviously, clearly some technical vocational areas where we need that essential face-to-face -face contact. And, uh, you know, that for every gain, potentially, in using technology to deliver learning, there's probably some, uh, some negatives as well. So I think it just calls on us as, as a sector to be very responsive, to be very engaged, to make sure that all our faculty is engaged uh, across all our campuses to make sure they're fully aware of the challenges they're facing and we have that laser-like focus on, on being able to improve outcomes for, 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 for learners not just for young people obviously but the, the increasing number of adult learners who might be coming back into college for, through various programs we mentioned the, the PLA earlier on but potentially coming in through other forms of employability support and we find a way of, of, of delivering you know what, what we call pedagogy of course in the sector and in education we find a, a, a way of, of enhancing and enriching the outcomes for learners in a way that's relevant to their actual experience. So it, it's going to be in the end, I think, the one size fits all, because already we are seeing different ways of delivering the curriculum, uh, essentially the same content of the curriculum in different ways to different people. Yeah, thanks, that Easton. No, great, great answer there. And um, Duncan, um, last one probably for you, just just quickly. Uh, how reliably can you anticipate changes to skills demand? Um, what's the optimal time frame for doing so? I, is it better to focus on short-term demands in line with programme development? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, at the moment, very short-term is probably the best because of uh, the, the sort of the level of change that, that's abroad. Um, you know, it's uh, quite difficult to make predictions about uh, uh, next week, uh, let alone next year. Um, but that's because this is a particularly strange year. Um, I think normally, yeah, um, sort of a, a year or two ahead you can make with some degree of reliability even three years ahead beyond that i think that you can only make um predictions about skills demand that are broad and so you know that's why these questions about technology and trade and so on are useful for helping you think about what is kind of going to be on in the, going on in the background what could be the case and therefore about kind of future proofing by just thinking about the sort of the, the broad direction of changes. It's so like most things, the sort of the more detailed you're making predictions, the more liable they are to be wrong. Um, and so doing it sort of in the short term for detail is normally fine. Doing it long term for detail is, you know, uh, giving a lot of hostages to fortune. Yeah, thanks, Duncan. And certainly, for those of you who are interested in skills, we'll we'll talk a bit more about those in uh, in sessions three and four, and um, looking at how they link to curriculum planning and careers insight. Um, so, so just to wrap things up um, for today, thank you very much to to um, to Duncan and to Yestin for for um, fascinating, excellent contributions. Um, thank you to everybody who's attended. I hope you agree that um, it's, it's been interesting and, and useful and giving you some food for thought. Um, as you go back into um, your institutions and uh, would definitely encourage you to attend the session on Friday, so session two, um, where yesterday we'll be convening that discussion with um, a series of, of college principals um, and the, the UK Managing Director for MZ, Andy Derman, and we'll be talking about how um, we can support colleges to um, support their local economies as we come through the, the um, this current crisis that we find ourselves in. So thanks again everybody for attending, have a great day and look forward to seeing you all soon.